Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the program director at the CBCA, the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts, and I am delighted and excited to welcome you to this webinar on real estate landlord tenant issues for uh, live music and performing venues. Uh, this is a very important topic uh, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and all the the various uh, shutdowns and stay, fit, stay at home and safer at home restrictions. Uh, this has taken a, a huge impact on our live music and performing venues, um, having to be closed and, and dealing with expenses. And one of those largest expenses is, is often rent or mortgage. Um, so we're excited to partner today with uh, NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association, uh, our local Colorado chapter, as well as members of NEVA across the country. So hello uh, to those you, of you watching live or watching this recording, uh, not from Colorado. It's wonderful to be able to share this information uh, literally coast to coast. I believe we had people sign up from all the way from New Jersey to, to Washington State, as well as many uh, Colorado venues. Um, also the Colorado Music Collective and CBCA and our Colorado Attorneys for the Arts program. A few housekeeping items uh, as, as the Zoom room starts to fill up um, and uh, before turning it over to our presenters. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, so this webinar will be shared uh, on CBCA's website afterwards as well as on our YouTube channel. So once that recording's live, all of you who registered will get an email about that recording and we invite you to share that with friends and colleagues in the field. Uh, this is also on the Zoom webinar platform, which means for those of you watching live, you are muted and your videos turned off, but that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you. Uh, we know you have questions and comments and thoughts and, and we want this to be an interactive uh, conversation. We want to make sure it can really be applicable to you. Uh, and so there are two ways uh, that you can share your, your thoughts and questions. The first is through the chat feature. You can chat either directly to us, the panelists, and we'll see that. Um, or you can, I believe, chat to everybody. Um, and then the best way actually to share questions is through the Q&A function. So you can type your question there. Um, and then our moderator will be able to see those as they come in um, and, and find the best way to get those questions integrated into the conversation and answered. Um, so you can find both of those probably on the bottom of your screen, uh, either the chat or the Q&A, because um, yeah, we want to hear from you. With that, I'm going to invite my other panelists here to uh, unmute themselves, turn their cameras on. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Um, uh, we w I wanted to give uh, Chris Zacker, uh, our partner at Levitt Pavilion Denver and with NEVA and the Colorado Music Collective to share a little bit about those organizations and what they're doing right now to support music and performing venues. Um, and then after that, we'll turn it over to Mike Lustig, our real estate attorney and Dave Ratner, um, a Colorado uh, attorney for the creative industries who will go through really the, the meat of the presentation. Um, but Chris, if you wanted to share a little bit about what you guys are working on. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us and partnering with us on this, Meredith. We greatly appreciate it to Dave and Mike. Thanks for doing this. Uh, on behalf of NEVA and the Colorado Music Collective, we'd just like to welcome everyone to this, to this chat today. Uh, if you're not familiar with NEVA yet, we are a national organization consisting of a few thousand venues across the United States that was formed uh, during this COVID crisis to advocate for rights and benefits for gig workers and for venues and for the health of our independent music industry. Um, you can find out more information about NEVA at the NEVA website and uh, also at the coloradomusiccollective.com. Uh, thanks a lot and I hope you all get a lot from this today. Ooh, I muted. Thanks, Chris. Uh, awesome. Yeah, they're, they're doing some really, really wonderful and important work. All right. Well, um, let's, let's dive in. Uh, so we have um, sort of a speaker and a moderator uh, with us today. So Mike Lustig is 
a real estate attorney, landlord tenant attorney, does a lot of work on commercial leases. Um, his, his law firm is the, the Colorado Real Estate Law, very appropriate for today's conversation. Um, and he's also an artist, so we'll, we'll have him in a moment give a, a bit more of a background and bio. Um, and then we've also invited uh, Dave Ratner with the Creative Law Network um, to, to help sort of facilitate this conversation today. Um, Dave's also very involved um, with CBCA and Colorado Attorneys for the Arts, so um, we know he's used to answering these questions on the fly. Um, and he'll really fill the role as, as moderator. So as you're sending in questions, um, Dave will be keeping an eye on those. I will as well. Um, but to help sort of steer the conversation along, I know Mike has some, some talking points that he wants to get through, but we'll make sure there's, there's ample time for Q&A. So with that, I'm actually gonna stop sharing our screen so we're not distracted by that. We'll just turn it over to our presenters. Um, I think Chris, you and I, we can turn our, our video and, and mute ourselves for now and just let uh, Dave and Mike run the show. Thanks. That was great. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I know Mike is, is with us or will be with us momentarily um, and that he is really the expert in the field here. As Meredith said, I am, I'm an attorney. I run a law firm called Creative Law Network. We specialize in, in working with creative people and businesses and uh, definitely a lot in the music industry. We, uh, I personally help get Colorado Attorneys for the Arts off the ground and am the chair of the advisory committee for Colorado Attorneys for the Arts. For those of you that don't know, uh, CAFTA, Colorado Attorneys for the Arts, CAFTA provides pro bono legal services to members of the arts community, artists, arts businesses, arts organizations throughout Colorado. So when uh, Neva reached out to us and said, hey, we're hearing about a lot of folks from, uh, you know, from, from Neva that are having questions about what we, what we in legal industry would call landlord tenant issues, right? Rent um, and, uh, uh, and how to keep ourselves going in, in the face of not being able to be open. Uh, we basically brought Neva and CAFTA together to answer those questions and have Mike provide some background. Um, as Meredith said, Mike is a, an attorney that is uh, specialized in real estate law, so he deals with landlord tenant issues all day. He's also an artist. If any of you have been to the Mission Ballroom here in Denver, Colorado, uh, Mike is actually the one who built that uh, now very famous disco ball, the giant disco ball that hangs in, in the Mission Ballroom is Mike's creation. Uh, as well as a lot of other artwork over the years. So, um, Mike, I don't know if you want to hop in here and kind of give yourself an intro. Um, I'm going to let uh, Mike kind of go through a lot of the basics of, of real estate law, of landlord tenant law, and the issues that we're facing. We know what, that a lot of you are facing. And as Meredith said, please hit us up in the Q&A or in the chat. I will make sure those questions are extended to Mike, and we'll keep this uh, going so that everyone gets their question answered. So, <coughs> Mike, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, to continue a little bit uh, about my background, I've been a lawyer since 2006. I also have a master's degree in real estate finance and construction management and have also worked as a portfolio specialist for a NASDAQ traded lender. But what I really do day in and day out is commercial leases uh, representing both landlords and tenants. And right now, a lot of the work that I'm doing is trying to help parties negotiate um, rent abatements, deferments, forbearances within this COVID crisis because the alternative is litigation, which can be exponentially more expensive than trying to cut a deal with the other party. Um, unfortunately, Right now, there is uh, some significant degree of uncertainty because many courts are closed, especially courts here in Colorado. Governor Polis placed a moratorium on eviction proceedings through the month of May. So we're not really able to get the type of certainty that could provide specific guidance across a large swath of transactions yet but I expect that should be happening soon. But really, when we're thinking about how to interpret these things, the, the first place 
where we have to look is, is the lease itself. Now, within commercial transactions, courts tend to want to strictly interpret leases, um, especially within commercial transactions more so than residential transactions, uh, because generally courts assume that parties to commercial transactions have a requisite amount of sophistication to adequately consider the risks that they're getting into and agreeing to with the other parties. And when we're talking about how COVID affects lease obligations, uh, the most common element of this crisis for a lot of people is the inability to make enough money to pay rent because of government mandated closures of businesses. And um, so when you can't operate, you can't make money. And if you can't make money, the purpose of your business is going to start to become frustrated. Now, whether, um, whether that frustration can be excused will really come down to what the lease says. And uh, the, some people might have heard uh, of this concept called force majeure, which is a, a common term that is included within leases. And you know, generally, most commercial leases have a force majeure clause. And how can I say this? Um, whether courts are going to um, interpret whether force majeure applies is going to very much depend on whether that clause is in there in the first place. So really the first place that you have to go to is the lease and if there is a force majeure clause. And then if there is a force majeure clause, how is it defined, what does it express, and what terms govern that clause? In most commercial leases that I work in, most uh, most force majeure clauses exclude rent um, from obligations that can be discharged under force majeure. And we'll later in the talk eventually get to how, um, how that situation can apply outside of the scope of a force majeure clause. But if we're looking at a force majeure clause under Colorado, there's a test, and there are a few different elements that apply. Now I'm gonna read these elements because they're from a court case, but there, there are three things that we have to look at. Uh, has an event occurred that could not reasonably be anticipated when parties entered into the contract? That's the first element. Now, I'm going to assume uh, most of the people who are on this call, most of the transactions that are being renegotiated have likely entered into lease agreements prior to the COVID crisis, not during the COVID crisis. And, you know, on one side of the fence, some people might try to argue that, you know, H1N1, SARS could have uh, caused parties to have reasonably anticipated a medical pandemic. Uh, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, and I'm not a judge um, or a lawmaker, I'm just a transactional lawyer, um, we're kind of in uh, an unprecedented time. We haven't experienced something like this since around 1918 with the, excuse me, with the uh, Spanish flu. And so I personally think that um, we are in a situation that could not be anticipated, especially when you have global government mandated shutdowns. Um, the next part of the three part test is uh, the party obligated to perform, or in this case, the tenant that is obligated to pay rent, uh, did not cause the event. I think this is a pretty easy hurdle to satisfy. Uh, and then the third part is the event made performance 
impossible or impractical uh, because of a change in the law or an extreme and unreasonable difficulty, expense, risk of personal injury or loss. And I think with government mandated shutdowns of non-essential businesses, this element of the test is also satisfied. So when we're talking about force majeure and when we're talking about these provisions, you know, when you're in a, in a situation where the parties can't come to an agreement, a likely uh, consequence is going to be litigation. And these are some of the issues that are going to be played out during litigation. Now, let's say that uh, there is no force majeure provision um, in the lease, that there are still opportunities to argue under common law doctrines of uh, impossibility or frustration of purpose, though this is kind of a, a tougher road to walk. Um, really though, in my opinion, uh, the best way to deal with these issues before litigation is with clear and open communication of your situation and also at least an understanding that it is a multifaceted issue. Some landlords might have obligations to lenders which prevent them from modifying leases or entering into deferments. Some landlords um, might not have the ability to defer their mortgages and are dependent on the payment of rent from their tenants to prevent foreclosure on their properties. So th there are um, a lot of circumstances from uh, the perspective of multiple parties to consider. And really though, uh, if you're looking at the lease and trying to communicate, let's say with your landlord, if you're a tenant that's having difficulty paying rent, uh, the best thing that you can do is communicate um, how this COVID crisis has prevented or frustrated the performance of your ability to comply uh, with performance under the lease, uh, whether that is a monetary obligation or some other form of obligation, and also the steps you're taking to mitigate your own losses and damages, and also specific requests in terms of what could work for you or what you would be open to. And same with the landlord side. You know, many tenants are wanting certainty. And I've, I've encountered recently uh, a number of situations where landlords have been radio silent uh, regarding communications that are coming from tenants asking landlords what is possible. And I also don't think that's helpful uh, but really, in terms of um, what things are going to look like practically, um, well, maybe I'll rewind this a little bit. Like, let's say, for example, um, the consequence of, of what happens if a landlord is um, unwilling to provide a deferment or a forbearance. I mean, uh, a landlord could take efforts to evict. And you know, one thing that I think a landlord has to consider in making that choice is access to the court system. Because there is going to be a significant backlog of cases trying to get pushed through for dockets. And it's not really going to be um, a quick and easy process for landlords to get in get a judgment and enforce a judgment. And that also ties into what I would call potential liability versus practical liability. If you're a tenant that 
is going through the process of eviction, landlords generally have a duty to mitigate their damages and take efforts to commercially reasonable efforts to advertise the space, show the space, find a substitute replacement tenant, and attempt to enter into a lease uh, on commercially reasonable terms before pursuing a, a judgment against a tenant for the entire unpaid balance of rent due for the remainder of a term. But that's kind of the, the situation that we're all facing, and it also uh, gives me a sense of hope that compromises can be reached because if landlords are trying to strictly enforce the terms of their lease and it's impossible for those tenants to perform under the lease, the limitation of court access is really going to make it financially more painful for them. So I think there is a lot of motivation on the side of both uh, on both party sides to try to enter into agreement. And the best way to facilitate that, in my opinion, is with clear and open communication and a willingness to listen to what the other party is going through. So that's kind of the, the situation where we stand. There is a lot of uncertainty and whether decisions are going to be pushed through um, is going to depend on the, well, there, there will definitely be decisions pushed through, but um, whether those decisions can be applied to other situations that aren't directly related to the court case where a decision is being made is, is going to depend on a number of factors. And I would encourage everybody who is seeking more guidance to get legal representation, uh, to speak with an attorney, ideally one that has experience with these matters. Um, and um, you know, as a disclaimer, this is not legal advice. I'm not your attorney necessarily. I'm not sure who's on this call. So, uh, but really, I would like to emphasize the importance of clear and open communication. And if you are having trouble um, as a tenant paying rent or as a landlord deferring rent, that you communicate that. And going through the process of lease negotiation, what that could actually look like, what I have been structuring lately for some clients is a forbearance agreement that says, for example, um, rent for this period, this specifically defined period of time is going to be um, deferred. So you might say rent for March and April might be deferred. And if we're just using hypothetical numbers like okay, rents $1,000 a month, just use easy math. You have a $2,000 balance that has to be paid off. Well, when does that have to be paid off? You know, you could say six months from now, in addition to your base rent and your additional rent, you're going to make a forbearance rent payment amount, uh, let's say $500 a month uh, for the next four months. And then that's how you're going to discharge your deferred obligation. So that's one way of handling it. But there are many ways of handling it, and that's really going to be dependent on um, each transaction's specific circumstances uh, and each party's needs and limitations. So that's, I mean, that's generally the, the rundown. Um, well, Mike, creating let me ask an, you. If I, sorry to interrupt you, I just might as well ask you, because sure. when you're talking about a, a forbearance agreement, um, you know, I think that a lot of what you're talking about is open communication, negotiating with the other party. And so to the extent you come to an agreement, whether it's for deferment of rent or some other arrangement, how would you, I mean, how would that be memorialized? How would you 
make sure that sticks? How do you prove it that, oh, yeah, these parties agreed that we're going to change the deal? Oh, sure. Well, you definitely want things that are objectively provable. So entering into an amendment uh, needs to be in writing, needs to be signed by both parties, uh, needs to adequately, specifically, and comprehensively describe what it applies to and what it does not apply to. And generally, you know, generally the, the cost of that, because um, a lot of people have fears working with lawyers because lawyers can be expensive and costs can run out of control. Um, the, the, the relative cost of something like that is going to be a, a fraction of the cost of pursuing litigation, either as a plaintiff or a defendant. Uh, you know, it might take uh, a lawyer an hour, a transactional lawyer such as myself, and a half hour, an hour to draft something up. Uh, whereas if you're talking about court, you're dealing with case law, you're dealing with statutory law, you're dealing with pleadings and filings and court appearances, and all of this take up a lot of time, and that's why it costs a lot of money. Right, right. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because as lawyers, we are very reflexively going to start talking about if you have to go to court. Um, and as you said, the courts aren't open right now, at least not in Colorado mm -hmm. and not in most places. So evictions aren't even being processed. Um, I think that there is, like, hopefully there are negotiations going on. You were talking about the, um, the possibility of an eviction, and the notion behind an eviction is that the tenant wants to stay, but the landlord's kicking them out. Um, we got a question um, from, from a member uh, of the audience here, an attendee, who said, well, what if we want to get out of the lease? How do, how, what are our options for getting out of a lease? Now, I know that every lease is different, but what are your, in general, when someone says, I need to get out of this lease, considering COVID, what are your thoughts? Sure. So, uh, you know, generally circling back to the way that leases are interpreted, commercial contracts are interpreted, it, you know, in the same, how can I say this? Um, landlords, for example, uh, generally don't have the ability to terminate in the same way that tenants don't have the ability to terminate. You know, so like um, a landlord is probably not going to have an easy road saying, hey, I'm experiencing some hardship, therefore, like, I get to cancel your lease as a tenant, and then you no longer uh, have a right to run your business out of my store because I'm experiencing hardship. Uh, generally, if you are going to need to cancel your lease, uh, one thing that I would caution against is trying before saying you need to cancel your lease, trying to work out some form of agreement or settlement to avoid what is known as an anticipatory breach. So you have to be really careful in your communication. But let's say you have to cancel your lease. Uh, most commercial leases have personal guarantees, so that's something that needs to be considered with any tenant's decision to take that step of canceling a lease, because when you do cancel a lease, you're going to trigger contractual provisions that govern default. Uh, and default is the term uh, that comes into play when a party isn't performing their obligation. So under a lease, you're gonna have a number of obligations, uh, but most importantly and materially, you're gonna have the obligation to pay rent for a certain period of time. Most commercial leases um, generally tend to be between three years on the low end and 10 years on the high end. So let's say, you're five years into a 10-year lease and your business is not solvent and you don't have the ability to pay rent, you have to make a hard choice between paying rent or paying for health insurance and feeding your family, right? I mean, I think most people are going to choose um, the latter option to continue to survive. So then that places us in the situation of, okay, uh, a person that can't pay the rent, that doesn't 
want to continue the lease, wants to break the lease, has to take some level of risk. And the, the risk is multifaceted. You know, landlords have a duty to mitigate, uh, to limit, uh, limit the losses that they incur. But the economic environment that we're in is uncertain. Usually, if we're just talking about an eviction, uh, an eviction procedure and landlords duty to mitigate and what's normal in normal economic times, um, a, a, a tenant might breach the lease, say they need to break the lease, cooperate with the landlord. Uh, the landlord's going to advertise the premises as being available. And in most, let's say, retail situations, if you're just talking about, let's say, a strip center, might take between two to four months on average. Now, with music venues, I think this is more of a specific use, and you're going to have a harder time finding a suitable substitute tenant to either take over the lease or um, just enter into a new lease. You know, some things that tenants should consider, not everybody has this, but business interruption insurance um, is an option. Now, in, in many instances, insurers are unwilling to cover losses relating to acts of God, but I've been reading some things that uh, certain states might enact laws that force insurance companies to pay out. But then again, you know, we go back to judges and courts being hesitant to um, to create changes in private agreements between parties. Um, sorry if I'm going off. No, you're on fine. A, I mean, on a, you, I think on you're a touching. Tangent, Dave. No, you're touching on a lot of things that I think are probably relevant. And what we want to do is is give folks as much you know information that might be relevant to their situation. Yeah. Um, you know, we got another question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and, you know, one, one other thing that tenants may want to consider, because this, you know, the, we're speaking to a, a collective of, of music venues. So many leases have assignment provisions that, um, and those assignment provisions usually require uh, landlord consent to an assignment. Some don't, uh, but just thinking creatively here, if the members of the of this association have um, connections and relationships with other members, and those members might want to work a work a deal where one who might have more financial capacity can uh, buy the business of a tenant that's experiencing hardship and you bring that to a landlord, um, a landlord might be open to that because having a deal in hand is certainly going to be more attractive to landlords who are generally interested in collecting rent, you know, not shopping deals, not trying to find a substitute tenant. If you bring a suitable assignee to a landlord, uh, they might be willing to work with you. You know, another option to consider which is probably distasteful considering that this is a, an association of independent music venues, but still an option, is to consider, you know, the big players in the music industry like Live Nation, like AEG. You know, I think they're looking for ways to pivot and look for new business opportunities. Now, whether, whether the members of this association feel that selling a venue to, you know, the a major corporation is selling out you know that's that's a different story that's a but, different conversation uh, <laughs> that's a different story it's a different conversation but in terms of financial survival it might be a viable option well no i think your point is is in the larger sense is that to consider all options to think outside the box. I mean, you know, when unusual times can call for unusual solutions. And I think that's a good point is to always be thinking about those options. We actually, we got a question from, from an attendee who, um, <laughs> for, for better or worse, their, their lease had just ended uh, this past month, oh, but they had, or good. they, well, we, right. That's what I thought, but they had yeah. to, or rather they signed a month to month lease in order to keep okay. the liquor license. 
because they had sure. to, right? So that makes sense. Um, but now they're seeing that they probably won't have any income um, until the end of this year at the earliest. So the question is that it was asked is, I'll, I'll just read it directly. Is there some kind of arrangement that I could make to not pay while we're not using the space or maybe pay less? Do I have rights here or is this just an agreement between me and my landlord? Mm, well, I think uh, the, the rights that that tenant has is they have a, a right to uh, maintain possession of a premises in exchange for paying rent. And generally, I'm, I'm not a liquor licensed lawyer, but my understanding with licenses in general is there has to be a, a physical address or location associated with a license in order it, for it to remain active. Um, now, whether the, the landlord is, is willing to agree to take less payment uh, is a weighing of, of interests, you know, like, and what are the landlord's other options? You know, can the landlord market the space and find a, a suitable replacement tenant that will pay as much or more in rent or provide them with a, a greater degree of financial certainty by committing to a multi-year uh, lease versus a month-to-month lease? You know, right. That, right. That, that depends on the, the economic climate. I, th I think... If I'm just shooting from the hip here, it's probably within the landlord's interest to uh, come up with some kind of compromise, especially with a month-to-month -month tenant, because the other choice of the landlord is, okay, if they don't want to play ball, then the month-to-month -month tenant sells their liquor license, and as soon as they sell it, they provide notice to the landlord, then the landlord's not getting any rent. Right, they let it last. So, you know... Yeah. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of how I would approach the situation. And in general, uh, I think when a party communicates their desire to alter the terms of an agreement that were contemplated prior to this crisis, it's helpful to remind the party that you're communicating with of the other uh, options that they have should they not compromise. Not play ball, right, exactly. And, and not play ball. Because yeah. I think it's it's within landlords' best interests to compromise to some extent, uh, whether it's a deferment, a rent reduction, or something with a tenant who is invested in a, a business that wants to be there uh, and is experiencing the same hardship that m most people over the globe are, are experiencing, rather than try to find somebody new, fill the space, negotiate a lease, and then deal with all of the concessions that landlords frequently have to provide, whether it's brokerage fees or uh, tenant improvement allowances. Uh, yeah. which can be expensive and take a long time for landlords to then recoup their investment, which is why most commercial leases have multi-year terms generally at minimum five years. Yeah, no, I think that may, you make a very good point. And it's interesting because you and I as transactional attorneys are used to negotiating things all the time. I actually, and, and so we, as what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, think of this as a negotiation, think of it as what, think, put yourself in the other guy's shoes, what are his or her interests, what mm -hmm. is going to be important to them. But I also think, it's, you know, a lot of the people on this call are probably quite used to negotiating as well. If they're, uh, if they're also the promoters in their space, they're used oh, to yeah. negotiating deals with, with agents all the time. So I'd say, mm -hmm. you know, think about this as a negotiation, you know, and, and, and prioritize those things and think about your position in that negotiation similarly to you would if you're, if you're booking, a, you know, booking a night at, the sh at your venue. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of, the, some of the other the questions that I'm seeing, Mike, kind of relate to what I would generally call tenants rights, um, which is a, obviously a, a very broad term. But because actually the, the last question I, I read to you, he said, you know, he said, what are, do I have any rights here? Um, and I think that um, 
that I imagine, I don't know, maybe this varies state to state, I'm not really sure, but yeah. maybe you can speak a little bit to, um, I know we've talked a little bit about how this can affect based on what's in the contract. Are there things, are there rights that are just inherent in the law that tenants have that they could exercise in this situation? Well, um, being able to exercise rights, I mean, you certainly have uh, uh, the right to due process under the law. Right. You know, right. if you're not paying rent, a they landlord can't, can't simply kick you out or uh, they, there is a, a, I'm forgetting the term of art here, but landlords can't just lock the doors, bar you from entering the premises and keep all your stuff sell your stuff in a fire sale without going through a process, uh, FED process, uh, forcible entry and detainer, uh, to get a judgment that proves you're in default and then eventually get what's known as writ of restitution. Mm -hmm. uh, that has to be enforced by the local county sheriff. And again, this is why I say it's within the party's interest to cooperate. Because normally, the, the process of eviction, if we're talking about just normal economic times, in the best case scenario, quickest, takes about a month. Uh, <laughs> best case, I, we are not and that's, and that. that is, and that is best case scenario. <laughs> right. and, and I've done eviction procedures on pro, um, the part of landlords uh, against commercial tenants before. And I mean, I've had situations where tenant hasn't paid rent uh tenant doesn't doesn't uh file an answer to an eviction hearing doesn't show up to the appearance hearing a default judgment is made giving the landlord the right to the right to repossess the premises and the county sheriff uh in one instance took three weeks to mm -hmm. to come and serve the writ of restitution which then provides the landlord the legal right to remove that tenant's uh, personal and business property from the premises, change locks, et cetera. And that, this was a month and a half uh, period of time just for a landlord to exercise their right without opening themselves up to liability for wrongful eviction, which can be very expensive if, uh, if a landlord is wrongfully evicting a tenant. So when you have a situation where courts have been shut down for a month, and you've got tons of businesses that don't have the ability to pay rent and lots of. Well, we just lost Mike, but I think he's going to, I'm sure he'll come right back to us. <laughs> uh, probably click the wrong button there. Um, but I think what, what he was probably getting towards is that there's a lot of businesses in these situations. And again, another thing to think about that while venues are certainly, uh, we can all agree, disproportionately affected by this crisis you know we do see that uh that certain retail stores are starting to open in some places that even restaurants are starting to open in some places we know that that, that venues in particular are, the, are going to be the last on the list here that are going to be able to hello reopen. oh we got you back hello hey. sorry so, sorry about that uh my my computer screen fell asleep uh because i was yammering <laughs> on and, I was uh, I was I, continuing your yammering for you. Okay. So, uh, but but yeah, like picking up where where I left off. Uh, if you have this backlog of cases, uh, just to get into the court system, and then a backlog of writs of restitution that just need to be enforced, uh, this month and a half long period is going to stretch. Uh, into multiple months. So when you approach the landlord from the perspective of, hey, um, I'd rather, you know, if we could enter into an agreement where this two or three or four or five months of rent can be uh, paid off over, you know, one year, two year, three years from now, um, the, the landlord might crunch the numbers and say, hey, it makes a lot more sense to defer this rent, get it back on the back end, rather than purely losing Lose it all together. Well, also, rent. Would you also say, I, I've heard this, uh, the option of, if let's say you have 48, month le 48 months left on your lease, mm -hmm. and you say, I can't pay rent for the next four months, let's make it a 52 month lease, and we'll just tack it on at the end. Are you seeing that around in, in your experience? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, um, 
I'm seeing tenants try to do that. Um, the general. <laughs> <laughs> not know, seeing landlords enjoying it. Uh, I'm not seeing landlords enjoying. Well, you know, sure, you know, you tack it on to the end. It's a 52 month lease. Well, that still means the landlord isn't getting paid rent for four months, which still has, gives them an economic hardship. I've, mm -hmm. I'm representing a, a tenant right now, uh, and we've actually put that out there. Uh, we've mm -hmm. yet to hear back, but. Uh, We'll, we'll see. My general impression and intuition is landlords aren't going to be super crazy about that. And mm -hmm. they would rather, you know, get, be made whole rather than just have more time on the lease and have four months. Of, so they, uh, they'd of rather pay. amortize it over, uh, over a certain amount of time. Right. That makes sense. That makes Definitely. sense. Well, one thing you and I both have kind of mentioned here is that we're both um, in Colorado. Um, I mean, I, I'm licensed in other states, but, um, and I know you said you do work in something like 17 states. Does what you're talking about today vary from state to state? Are there state law considerations that our attendees should know about? Definitely. And just to put this out there real quick, so I don't get in trouble with the Colorado Bar Association. Uh, my <laughs> conversations with the Ethics Committee uh, and, and people within the Ethics Committee has permitted me to have limited scope of transactional representation. I, you are, you are so, not practicing uh, law in those states. Yeah, I did not accuse so you long, of that. So long as I have participating local counsel involved in said transaction, who are licensed in that state of jurisdiction. Just Thank you for clarifying. That, yeah, just putting that out there. But yeah, uh, laws differ uh, in states, but commercial transactions and leases um, as, as a whole um, are, are pretty substantially uniform uh, through, throughout most ju jurisdictions. Um, they're generally governed in the same way. There's a lot of overlap in with the terms that, you know, structure these transactions. Uh, but yeah, in terms of specific guidance uh, within how, how uh, courts work there, how the eviction process works there, it, it can be very different. You know, many states like Colorado have, uh, landlords have duty to mitigate their damages, uh, which, provides you know let's talk that, about that a little bit i yeah. think some people might be familiar with that concept talk about that a little bit yeah well landlord duty to mitigate meaning uh let let's say you have a 10-year lease and uh as a tenant and your business uh your business uh fails in year one and you have nine years remaining on your lease in in, st in states that have uh, duties to mitigate on the part of landlords. Landlords can't just go and uh, file a lawsuit, get a judgment against a tenant or its personal guarantor, and say, you owe me nine years of unpaid rent, and then the landlord gets a judgment, and then let's say leases it, releases the space six months from now. Or right? doesn't. Even if he does, you know, it, or just decides to leave it as a va vacant shell right. and let it right. sit vacant. Uh, in many states, landlords don't have uh, the right to do that. In some states, though, there is no duty to mitigate. And um, but then again, there's a big difference between getting a judgment and enforcing a judgment. And frequently, even when there is a judgment, um, the the process of enforcing it is a completely different story. And landlords might be willing to enter into settlement agreement, which may or may not include payment plans, things of that nature. Yeah, yeah, no, that, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think, I, by the way, I wanna make sure to remind our attendees to please hit us up in the Q&A uh, if you have any questions or hit us up in the chat if you have any questions. We only got about 10 minutes left here. I'm, I'm happy to keep Pepper and Mike with my questions, but I, we really do wanna hear sure. from, from, from the attendees with their questions. Um, I think another one that, that is kind of coming up here is that there is obviously, these venues aren't choosing to be shuttered, right? We're not choosing to close our businesses. Um, and whether, you know, for whatever reason, whether it is a, a state uh, or, or local ordinance or ruling that has made or, or regulation that has made that necessary, 
I think that, you know, one of the questions is kind of, is there a theory or a tactic that we could be used to say, hey, I didn't shut my business, the government shared my business or the, you know, and, and therefore I can't pay my lease, so you can't hold me responsible. Yeah, it, and that is going to fall, you know, first, ideally under force majeure, force majeure right. if there is a specific, specific clause. And even within force majeure, um, it's going to be strictly construed, but you might have a provision that says, uh, you know, obligations can be delayed, right? Or you might have a provision that says obligations can be discharged. Uh, there's, there's a big difference between delayed versus discharged. Uh, but even if uh, force majeure doesn't cover what we're talking about here, you still have these common law doctrines of impossibility and frustration of purpose that can be applied. But this is, this is the certainty that we're eventually hoping to step into once case law develops that is specifically related to COVID and lease transactions. Yeah. Yeah, I think but you, actually... you could you could certainly argue that uh, this is a situation that if uh, that if a global health pandemic results in the government mandating uh, the closure of non-essential businesses, I think there is an argument that can be made that a, a business is unable to operate and therefore it's impossible for them to uh, operate their business and therefore impossible for them to be commercially viable and therefore impossible for them to make enough money to pay rent. And then, now, whether that allows uh, businesses to terminate their lease is, versus just not paying rent is a, is a right. very different story uh, and not pay rent for the period of time that the crisis is, you know, occurring. Very different story. And I think it's going to be far harder for, um, for tenants to argue that because of COVID shutting down their business for, let's say, three months or making it financially more challenging to operate based on social distancing requirements for let's say six months or a year that therefore it makes it impossible for them to perform their obligations um, under the entirety of the remainder of the term. Right, right. Well, you know, I think one last thing I figured I wanted to make sure to cover, which is, you know, you and I both understand. You put yourself in the in the position of being a, a venue owner, um, however, yeah, you know, however small or, or large the venue is, and you know you can't be open right now. Um, you may be having good talks with your landlord. Maybe your landlord is not responding. Any thoughts on actions, uh, things that the average tenant can do to give themselves the best chance of survival, the best chance of being treated well? Again, we don't. Uh, you know, we've we've made very clear. Um, the courts have not ruled on this. We don't know what to expect. There isn't precedent for this, so we don't have anything to look towards. So I know you're shooting from the hip. I know you. We're not holding you to it. But just yeah, as yeah. far as thoughts on what you know, when a, when a tenant is, is in a situation, what uh, what are some good preventive measures or good things to think about? I mean, always clear and open communication. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. reaching out to the landlord, even if the landlord isn't responding. Document they, your email. Keep track of your document. Emails. Yeah, document your, your efforts. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, don't don't make phone calls and leave voicemails. Put it in a letter. Send it certified mail. Put it in an email. Put it in a letter with your rent check. Because if you're sending a check in the mail and they're expecting the rent, you know, if they're going <laughs> to open the letter, <laughs> they're going to read it. Uh, so, yeah, and, and send it by a certified mail. Take uh, steps that can objectively show that uh, you're making an effort to communicate your hardship and you're making an effort to try to enter into an agreement that as much as possible maintains the integrity of the relationship, provides adequate notice and expectations. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, because if you just decide instead to move out all of your equipment and say sorry, you, right. you know, and then go radio silent, the, the landlord is going to not take as kindly to that as something like, hey, we're having trouble. Hey, we would like some help. Hey, can we talk about this? Hey, what's your situation like landlord with your lenders? What are you open to? Here's, here's proposed solutions that we present that can work for us. Does this work for you? Uh, just being communicative and saying what's not working, saying what could work, and being proactive in terms of presenting a potential solution is, is the best thing that you, you can do. One, uh, I just got one question just here as we're closing up. Um, someone asked about bankruptcy. Um, if, if a mm. tenant files bankruptcy, does that protect him from, or generally, is that a protection from the requirements of the lease? Uh, well, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. Uh, I'm not versed in bankruptcy. Uh, one thing to consider is um, the personal guarantee, you know, because you can file bankruptcy as a business, but if you're right, but if you personally guarantee I mean, the if lease, you're personally then you're still guaranteeing on it. the lease, you're still right. on it unless you then also file for bankruptcy personally. But that can have a whole host whole of ramifications that if somebody is considering that 100% speak with a bankruptcy lawyer who can inform them. And, you know, again, every situation is different, uh, totally. even though most leases are very similar to each other in terms of the elements that they're comprised of, there are provisions um, that can differ greatly. And those differing provisions can create a different amounts of uh, obligation and liability exposure to the respective parties. Yeah, I would agree. I think that, that that's exactly right. I think bankruptcy is an, you know, a world unto itself. Um, and it is really something that, that does require the specialty and expertise there. Hopefully something folks aren't going to have to deal with, but I know it is on a lot of people's tongues right now. Um, well, I, we just got a minute here or two left. Any kind of final thoughts, anything else that you want to add in for folks before we uh, hand it back to Meredith and close it out? Yeah, I've got a real soft spot for music and for art. And if anybody uh, wants to talk with me further, uh, they can feel free to give me an email uh, at mike at co realestatelaw.com. CO is the state abbreviation of Colorado. Um, Please, though, if you're going to contact me, please email me because rather than call me because I'm frequently on phone calls with clients throughout the day and don't have the ability to pick up calls as easily as I have the ability to respond to emails and find a time that works with my schedule. But uh, I really want to help uh, as many people as possible avoid litigation because litigation is expensive. Uh, time consuming uh, and emotionally consuming. And uh, often I feel strongly that open communication and compromise can lead to a, a more palatable solution for both sides. That makes a lot of sense. And, and Meredith has posted your uh, email address in the chat. So for anybody who's on here, uh, you can find Mike's email address there in the chat of the Zoom here. You can also, if, uh, if, if, Mike's, if, for, if Mike is too busy or if you feel like you can't afford a lawyer, you can definitely contact Colorado Attorneys for the Arts, um, which is coloradoattorneysforthearts.org. And uh, mm -hmm. there's Meredith to help kind of put a bow on this and wrap it up for you. Oh, go ahead, Mike. I and I'm also a volunteer attorney for CAFTA. So you if go. you fall, fall into the uh, qualifications, <laughs> And uh, for being able to receive the pro bono representation, uh, I very may well have the bandwidth to take it up. Uh, but even if you, you know, even if you don't, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I, I want to help as many people as possible. So uh, anything I can do to help people have an easier life and an easier time um, is relevant to my interests. 
Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I heard Kat the, obviously I heard the whole presentation, but I was like, oh, that's, that feels like my cue to, to come back on. Um, and I just want to thank you, you both for um, everything you did today over this last hour, but I, I know you are both working very hard with artists and creative organizations right now um, to help them weather this storm. So we really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you not in Colorado, there are volunteer lawyers for the arts groups literally all over the country. Uh, look them up, Google them. We can help connect you uh, to your local um, uh, volunteer lawyers for the arts organizations. And we're just so grateful at CBCA to be able to provide this information. Like I said, we've recorded this webinar. It'll be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel. We'll send out that link afterward. Um, Chris, any final, final thoughts? Yeah, if anybody is on this call who owns a venue uh, or is a promoter who's not a member of NIVA, or NIVA already, uh, please uh, visit our website. You can sign up. It's, uh, it's really easy to do, and there's a lot of great advocacy work going on, both at the federal and state level. So thank you so much, uh, Mike and Dave, for uh, lending your time to this call today. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.